it's so wonderful to see you all here today. I'm LaShawn Jefferson. I'm the Senior Executive Director of Perry Rollhouse, Penn's hub for global engagement. Um, in a world of increasing demands and a constant time deficit, at least in my life, um, we at Perry World House are greatly appreciate that you've chosen to spend your time with us in our programming. So thanks to all of you for coming today for our program, Rising to the Global Climate Challenge, Australia's Leadership, featuring former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and Penn Professor Michael Mann. This evening's keynote is the first of three public programs for our 2022 Global Order Colloquium, the theme of which is a fracturing world, the future of globalization. Not only is today's program a part of the Global Order Colloquium, but it also serves as the launch of Dr. Michael Mann's new Penn Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media. We are, of course, delighted to be a part of Dr. Mann's new chapter at Penn. I'd like to thank our Penn co-sponsors and partners without whom today's program would not have been possible. The Penn Center for Science, Sustainability and the Media, the Annenberg Public Policy Center, and the School of Arts and Sciences. A special thanks to Dr. Mann for helping to organize this event with Prime Minister Turnbull, as well as to Dr. Kathleen Hall Jamison for moderating. It's now my great honor to welcome University of Pennsylvania President Elizabeth McGill, who will formally introduce the speaker and program. A proud North Dakotan, Elizabeth McGill is our ninth president. A legal scholar and inspiring leader, President McGill arrived at Penn after serving as executive vice president and provost at the University of Virginia. Prior to her role at UVA, she was the Richard E. Lang Professor and Dean of the Stanford Law School. A scholar of administrative and constitutional law, President McGill is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the American Law Institute. President McGill, we're grateful um, to you for joining us today and welcome to the stage. Thank you so much, LaShawn, and my thanks to the entire Perry World House team who are all over here. Uh, you have put Penn on the map for international engagement. I'm deeply grateful for your leadership and all of the hard work that has made that so. I'm also so pleased that so many of you are here today and, and tuning in remotely as well. We are going to hear from an all-star lineup of leaders and experts. The topics they will tackle could not be more urgent or more global in scope. Consider just a sample of recent news headlines. A punishing drought in Europe has cut the volume of some of its greatest rivers by half grinding shipping, agriculture, and recreation to a near standstill. Large regions of sub-Saharan Africa are suffering the worst drought conditions on record, while other areas contend with flooding. Here in the United States, we've endured record-breaking heat waves, violent storms, wildfires, and flooding as well. Around the world, the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events has only increased. Biodiversity threats, climate change refugees, food and water shortages, these grave challenges are increasingly the norm. Much like a pandemic, climate change does not respect international borders. It does not distinguish among cultures or languages. It is a global fact. And if we want to weather what is coming, then we need a global response. We also need the very best and brightest that great universities like Penn can provide. Our honored guest today has unique insight on this challenge and also how nations can work together toward solutions. He was the 29th Prime Minister of Australia, serving from 2015 to 2018. Prior to that, he entered the Australian Parliament in 2004 and subsequently served as the Minister for the Environment and Water Resources, as well as Minister for Communications. As Prime Minister, he made addressing climate change and promoting sustainable energy one of his top priorities. His focus on large scale storage and reliability for renewable energy sources led to the construction of the Snowy Hydro 2.0 initiative, the largest renewable energy project in Australia. He also knows better than most just how thorny and politically daunting this issue can be. Doing too little, however, is not a viable option. In his own words, if we keep pretending this change isn't coming, we'll miss the boat. Penn is pleased and deeply honored to welcome the 29th Prime Minister of Australia, the Honorable Malcolm Turnbull. Joining him today are two preeminent Penn scholars, 
each recognized as foremost leaders and experts in their field. Michael Mann is Presidential Distinguished Professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Penn with a secondary appointment in the Annenberg School for Communication. He is also a Perry World House Faculty Fellow, a Kleinman Center for Energy Policy Fellow, and a Distinguished Research Fellow at the Annenberg Public Policy Center. As I think everyone in this room knows, Professor Mann is a prolific scientist and prominent voice on climate change, education, and policy. He speaks and writes extensively for general audiences. His most recent book, The New Climate War, he is also co-founder of the award-winning science website, realclimate.org. And here at Penn, we are particularly excited to have Dr. Mann as the inaugural director of our new Penn Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media. A very warm welcome to Dr. Mann. Our moderator is the distinguished Kathleen Hall Jamison, the Elizabeth Ware Packard Professor of Communication at the Annenberg School. She's also the Walter and Lenore Annenberg Director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center. For countless people, many in this room I am certain, and around the world, Dr. Jamison's name is synonymous with the award-winning website resource, factcheck.org, which she co-founded and is a project of the Annenberg Public Policy Center. Dr. Dr. Jameson has published 17 books, a number of which have received awards. Her most recent title is Cyber War. I encourage you to go read it. A fellow of too many distinguished academies to actually do justice here. Uh, let me just say she is a renowned expert at the intersection of communications, politics, and public policy, which is ideal for leading and moderating today's discussion. A very warm welcome to Dr. Jameson as well. With that, Let me give this incredible panel the stage. Thank you for being here. And we're going to begin, but with some opening statements. Honorable Malcolm Turnbull. Oh, thank you very much. Look, it, it is thank you, and thank you, President McGill, for the warm welcome. It is uh, great to be here. As I was saying to uh, some of the team here at the Perry World House earlier today, it's uh, wonderful to be back in Philadelphia. My mother lived in this city for over 20 years and was a uh, professor of uh, Victorian literature at uh, Rutgers, N not this university, but just across the river in Camden. And so I'm pretty familiar with Philadelphia and it's, I love the city and it's, uh, it's great to be here. And I love the way Philadelphians love their city so much too. That's always very inspiring. So look, we're going to talk about climate change. Let me, let me tell you, I'll, I'll give you the bad news quickly and then the good news. The bad news is if we don't cut out burning fossil fuels, we are going to wreck this planet and make it uninhabitable, okay? Elon Musk, determined chap though he is, has so far failed to find another planet for us to move to. <laughs> so we either fix this one or we are seriously screwed. So that's the bad news. The good news is we have the means to do it. We do not need to win, you know, another 20 Nobel Prizes to find the answers. I mean, yes, technology will improve, efficiencies will improve, but we have the means to have abundant energy at affordable prices delivered in a reliable manner with zero emissions. We have the means to do that. Wind and solar, are the cheapest form of generating electricity today, pretty much anywhere in the world. And we have the means to store it, whether it is batteries for short terms, pump, pumped hydro, which is one of my personal obsessions, which if not restrained, I could easily talk for several days about, but I won't, so I won't do that, but we have the means to do it. In other words, we have the tools to do the job. Uh, but what we need to do is get cracking with it. We have been bedeviled by crazy politics and crazy media, 
none crazier than Rupert Murdoch's Fox News here in the United States, which regrettably is even more influential in Australia than it is here. But fundamentally, science denial, climate change denial is the biggest problem that we have, and of course, the vested interests of the fossil fuel lobby. So in other words, you know, you don't have to say, you know, how much am I prepared to pay to save the planet? The fact is you can have cheaper electricity if you get on with the job. So if we can replace ideology and idiocy with engineering and economics, we can get the job done. And that's what we should all be seeking to do. Thank you. Professor Mann. And do you feel energized right now? Do you think that we can do this now? Yes. And do you wish that he would move to the United States, gain citizenship and run for public office? <laughs> Professor Mann. Uh, so the last time I was on this stage, it was a job talk. <laughs> I believe that's a, a correct uh, assessment. Uh, so it's great to be back here uh, on this stage as a member of the Penn faculty now, and I'm very excited uh, at the opportunities that we have here to, to lead this conversation about what is arguably the greatest challenge we, we face as a civilization. Uh, I also want to establish my own Philadelphia bona fides here. Um, and so I will mention that uh, my father grew up in Philadelphia, spent a lot of time uh, here um, in the summers when I was growing up um, at the, their place on Rittner Street in South Philly. Uh, my father went to Penn, my grandfather went to Penn, and my uncle went to Penn. And who knows, our daughter might even go to Penn, you never know. Um, so more than two years ago, um, I arrived in uh, Sydney, Australia for a sabbatical. I had gone to Sydney to work with some scientists at the University of New South Wales, studying the impacts of climate change on extreme weather events in Australia. Little did I realize that I would arrive to experience the most profound extreme climate-driven extreme weather events in Australian history and maybe even in world history. It, to me, um, I first came face to face with the impacts of climate change um, in, in Sydney during what is now known as the Black Summer, the summer uh, where Australia witnessed unprecedented heat and drought and these uh, bushfires, these wildfires that um, uh, literally blanketed uh, the continent. Uh, and so, it, I ended up not getting nearly as much uh, research done as I had hoped, but I instead uh, spent uh, much of my time trying to talk about uh, the context um, for these extreme weather events, to try to help um, sort of explain how climate change is behind uh, the real-time disasters that were playing out. And as Malcolm can attest to, somehow when an American is there, um, they can be saying exactly the same thing that one of their Australian counterparts might have said, but, uh, but uh, there, there's something known as cultural cringe. You sort of get this audience because um, you're from outside the country. And so I had this opportunity to become part of this conversation. Um, one of the more delightful opportunities that came my way was uh, getting to know Malcolm. And I think what bonded us was our mutual dislike of uh, Rupert, uh, Rupert Murdoch and, and uh, News Corp, and, and our willingness to call out bad actors um, in the media, because there really are bad actors here. As Malcolm explained, we have the technology to address the climate crisis. We have the renewable energy technology to do it. We don't need, and, and new technology will help. It'll make that transition easier. But we can do it now with the energy technologies we have. The obstacles aren't technological. They are political. And what's profound to me is in the time uh, since that visit, and, and it, it, let me just say that, um, you know, I, I was uh, very pleased when it, it, it became clear that our first event uh, for the Penn Center for Science Sustainability in the Media would be this event with, with Malcolm, because I think we are both here at a very important time in history where we are seeing the devastating consequences of climate change play out in real time. There's no question about that. But we've also seen progress that we didn't expect to see at this point. Um, Australia is now back in a leadership position on climate. And the United States is now back in a leadership position. It doesn't mean we're doing everything we need to do. But we are getting onto that path now. We can see 
a path forward now where we keep warming below a truly catastrophic three degrees Fahrenheit, where we do commit to the worst consequences of climate change. And so we have this opportunity to talk about the developments um, in both Australia and the United States, and there's some commonalities and differences in the political systems that I think are worth talking about. And, 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 and we're, I do think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from, in particular, from uh, Australia's resistance. As, as dominant as the Murdoch media is in Australia, and far more dominant there, and I can attest to that having been there, than even here in the United States, um, the, the people have been somewhat resistant. Uh, and indeed, they elected a government that defied Murdoch's climate denialism and delay. Um, so this is a really important conversation for us to have um, less than, you know, two months now uh, out from a midterm election. And I don't think it's overstating things to say that this election will determine the course of future action on climate in the United States and therefore globally. Because if we don't lead on this issue, it is unlikely that we can bring other nations, especially developing nations to the table uh, to join in this effort. And so this is a really critical moment. Um, if we don't have a functioning democracy, we're not gonna be able to address any of the major challenges we face, including the climate crisis. And so this is a moment of um, great opportunity, but also of great peril. And I guess that's where I would leave it. Thank you both. Let me tell you something that you may not know about these two distinguished gentlemen. You know that they know the science. You know that they're acting on the science. You know that they have common media enemies in view. You know that they fought them dexterously. But I don't know that you know the extent to which they're talking to future generations. Professor Michael Mann has co-authored a children's book about climate. And if you go onto the web, you will see that the former prime minister engaged in a dialogue with I think four or five year olds based on what I could see of their age in which, and you must look at this tonight because if you want to feel good about the world, you will see exchanges in which a distinguished leader speaks to children in an intelligible fashion and then he interviews the children. So they ask him questions such as, why are prime ministers cranky? <laughs> and he asks them, if you were prime minister, what would you do? And here's the commonality. One of the children says, I would get rid of the factories so that I could save the polar bears. These are individuals who found a way, found a way to talk to the generations that are going to be affected going forward, not simply to the generations that are moving out of the picture and the generations that are currently in leadership and the generations, those of your generation, who are going to make these changes. So we not only have the privilege today of having two distinguished individuals, but two distinguished individuals who are extraordinarily effective communicators. And I'd like to start by adopting some language that the former prime minister used during the time that he was prime minister, but I've heard it since. Let's talk about the physics. So let me just ask, starting with Australia, if you had to speak to a United States audience that may not be as familiar as it would like with Australia, what would we see about the physics of climate change there that you would want us to know that we might not know that would inform our understanding about the global impact of climate change? Well, the physics of uh, climate change or global warming, I should say, is simply that we are going to have a hotter, a hotter planet. Uh, that's going to mean that we will have more fires, uh, and we will also, may seem paradoxically, uh, more floods, uh, because the hotter planet, of hotter you know, hotter planet evaporates more water, we have more water vapour in the atmosphere, which results in more precipitation. Uh, but it is, uh, it's, it's, if you like, it is more extreme. Um, you know, one of the most misleading things is an average, uh, a mean, uh, because uh, if you have somewhere where you say it's 28 inch average rainfall, that might, uh, I've no idea what that means in the American context, by the way, that might sound like it's pretty good country from a farming point of view, but if it all arrives in one week, uh, and you'd have nothing the rest of the year, it's catastrophic. So, you know, one of our great poets described Australia as the land of flouts, and, uh, the land of flood, of, of droughts and flooding rains. 
and that that has become more extreme. And we have literally gone from having one of our worst droughts ever uh, to having, and the fires were that uh, Michael spoke about so eloquently, which burned out 12 million hectares and killed oh, b billions of animals. I mean, just literally, you know, uh, just a, just it was a holocaust in the dictionary definition. It just a complete total destruction of fire of this of this of ecosystems and the um we have that and then that's now been followed by uh years that have been the, the wettest on record and so that's uh you know we're, we're we're seeing it we're seeing uh the consequences of global warming in all of their extremes but so are many other parts of the world too, including the United States. I mean, look at the drought in the western part of the United States. So, um, yeah, I think the I, I think the bottom line, Kathleen, is to say is just to say, you know, when people say they believe or disbelieve in global warming, it's about as intelligent as saying you believe or disbelieve in gravity. Now, you know, if anyone sitting in the gallery feels they disbelieve in gravity, they can at great risk to their personal safety, you know, do a quick test of their belief by jumping out off from the gallery, which none of them will do. Please don't. Please but, but please don't. Please don't. But this is this is the nuttiness of it. You know, that we have a phenomenon, a physical phenomenon, which has been well understood for centuries, the consequences of which we are now actually seeing in real time. And you still have people saying, oh, I don't believe it. One, one of the reasons that I wanted to start by asking about Australia was because the US media did convey the death of wildlife in a way that seemed to me different, Professor Mann, than what we've seen in the United States as we've gotten a media lens on what hap what's happening in climate. And I'm wondering the extent to which there is a message there about the, natures of, the nature of global warming and the effects on the planet that we should be communicating more extensively or perhaps differently. It, as you're thinking about the United States and the physics in the United States, are there things that we are not featuring that you think we ought to be featuring about the effect that we, we will tangibly be experiencing within our lifetime and may actually be occurring right now? Yeah, um, it, so let me comment also, you, you asked about you know, the differences between mm -hmm. here and Australia. And so as everybody in the audience knows, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, the Coriolis force um, leads to uh, circulations in the opposite direction. It's why the uh, Liberals are the Conservative Party in Australia, because <laughs> I can't figure out any other reason for that. It, it must be the, the Coriolis force. Um, but, you know, I, one of the things that I said when I was there in one of my interviews, um, you know, is if you were to design, if you were to seek out to design a continent that would be maximally impacted by climate change, it would be Australia. It's centered in the subtropics. Um, it's large. Um, the continental center is distant from maritime influences. So much of the continent gets very hot, uh, very dry in the summer. And of course, um, it has warm oceans. It's surrounded by warm oceans, which means there's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere. So when you do get those rainfall events, you get flooding rains. And I experienced that um, in my sabbatical in Sydney. We went from the, the black summer with the, you know, the heat and the drought and the wildfires to these drenching rains when we got into um, uh, February, late February and March. Um, and I experienced a, a rainfall event uh, in, in Sydney, unlike any that I had experienced uh, before. And one of the things that we saw, and we've seen that here in the United States, and it sort of gets at the question that Kathleen is asking about here, one of the things that we saw was that all of that soot and that you know degraded vegetation led to massive runoff uh, into the rivers and streams where it killed off some of the uh, you know the the the, the aquatic life um, there were large fish populations um, that uh, that succumbed to uh, these events and so what this gets at is the interactions what we're very good about when it comes to climate predictions is predicting linear changes. We can predict how warm it's going to get with some degree of accuracy. We can predict how dry it's going to get. What we don't do so well is thinking about how these 
different changes may interact with each other in a nonlinear way to produce things that we might not have gamed out, that we might not have thought about. We've seen that in the Western US with the wildfires and you know the heat, the drought, the wildfires destroys the vegetation, destabilizes the topsoil. So when you do get those drenching winter rains, you get massive mudslides and loss of life as we've tragically seen. Um, in, in California because of that. Uh, here is another example in Australia where we see the interactions. And so as Malcolm said, um, climate change isn't just a change in the average, it's a change in the extremes. A warmer planet means more extreme heat, that's obvious. Um, warmer summers, you dry out the soils, you get worse drought. But a warmer atmosphere means that when you do get rainfall events, uh, you're more likely to get those extreme flooding events. And so you see greater extremes on both sides of the scale, and it's those extremes that lead to massive impacts. It's not the average change, it's those extreme events. And part of my research in recent years, and the reason that I went to Australia in the first place, was to investigate some of the more subtle ways that climate change is influencing these uh, extreme weather events. And, and, and our research shows that um, you know, the models aren't doing a good job, for example, in predicting uh, the behavior that we're seeing in the jet stream, where you get these huge meanders in the jet stream that give you big high and low pressure systems. High pressure system, dry, hot, low pressure system, wet. And those systems tend to stay locked in place. So it's hot and dry in the same location day after day like we see out west, or you get the sorts of summers that we've seen uh, in, the, um, in the eastern US um, in recent years where it just seems to rain almost every day. Um, that behavior, it turns out to actually solve the physics that describes that behavior, you have to use the same mathematics that was developed to solve problems in quantum mechanics. So it's actually pretty complicated math and physics and it turns out that, that 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 physics isn't well captured in many of the models we use even today for climate change projections. So it's a reminder that uncertainty isn't our friend and that in some respects these impacts are actually playing out sooner and with greater magnitude than we expected. That's true with extreme weather events, these very persistent extreme weather events. It's true with the collapse of the ice sheets and their contribution to sea level rise. So when somebody tells you that uncertainty is somehow cause for inaction, it's just the opposite. Uncertainty is a reason for even greater action. Let's turn from effects to cause, and let's have a moment of brutal self-awareness. We in the United States tend to overestimate the extent to which we're the best at everything. We're actually the worst at many things. There's some contributions about which we should be profoundly ashamed. Let's ask the question, Relatively, how much of this problem has been caused by Australians and people in Australia relative to the United States and people in the United States? Either one of you gentlemen can take the first response. I'm, I'm going to take credit here. <laughs> um, the United States, let's never forget, we are the world's largest cumulative carbon emitter. People love to talk about China, whose emissions right now are higher than ours, but we've been doing this for two centuries. Here in Pennsylvania, this is where we discovered oil back in the 1800s. Uh, that, our state was built on coal and now natural gas um, is, a, is a huge part of our economy as well and influences the politics in this state. So, you know, let's, let's, let's take ownership. Let's recognize that we have the worst legacy when it comes to the climate crisis. We're responsible for the most carbon pollution and the most warming and the most of the impacts of climate change that we're seeing. And because of that, it is incumbent upon us to lead. Um, and, and, and that's something that I think we have to remember. It's not just enough for us to barely meet our commitments. We have to be exceeding our commitments. Well, the, the only reason your uh, America's emitted more CO2 than Australia is because there's more Americans than there are Australians, uh, frankly. The, uh, the, Australia has a very rich endowment of fossil fuels, coal uh, and gas in particular, and is the either the world's leading or second leading exporter of LNG, liquefied natural gas, and ditto for seaborne coal. Uh, our energy mix 
has been electricity generating energy mix has been uh, overwhelmingly coal, but that is changing very rapidly. That's the that's the really good news. Um, Australia is uh, currently installing more uh, renewables, by which I mean solar and PV, solar PV and wind, per capita than just about anywhere else in the world. Really rapid growth, even more than China uh, or the United States. Although, obviously, the numbers here and in China are you know bigger because they're bigger countries. Um, the uh, the, the point Kathleen makes, however, is is a very valid one. That there is a lot of uh, a lot of history there, and so, for example, uh, if you go to a climate change uh, conference, which I've been to a few, and you're talking to the leaders of other countries, you will find developing countries, and this is say very much the Indian position, for example, they will say, "Well, you know, you want us to cut our emissions. That's great, but you know what? Uh, we've got." X million people in our country that have no electricity at all, literally no energy at all, other than you know burning the wood they can pick up in the in the forest, uh, and so we've got to we've got to get roll out energy as quickly as we can. And by the way, most of that CO two up there in the sky was put there by you know all you rich people. So so you know there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of intergenerational justice issues here and, and international justice issues here. Having said that, we've, we're all in the same boat. You know what? I mean, the argument, the, the argument is not to say India should and China should increase emissions until they've emitted as, if they emit as much per capita as America and Australia have done, then we're all doomed. Whether we are Indian, Chinese, American, Australian, whatever. So the, the, the important message is that developed countries, wealthy countries, have got to do everything we can to support the transition in the developing world. And that particularly involves things like sharing technology. Now, as it happens, China is by far the leader in solar technology in particular. Interestingly, again, the, uh, the PERC cells, I don't know if there are any photovoltaic scientists here, but the PERC cells, which are at the core of the photovoltaic unit in a solar panel, were actually developed at the University of New South Wales uh, in what was, you know, really act actually great collaboration between Chinese and Australian scientists. So every, every, pretty much every single solar panel sold today has Australian tech in it. But, and again, this gets back to the question of uh, resilience and, uh, you know, ensuring that uh, a country like America still makes things. Uh, about 85% of all the solar panels in the world are made in China. Now, whatever view you have about China as a rival, a competitor or whatever, it is nuts to have, you know, just one country being responsible for such a huge percentage. So. You know, there are a whole, and you can make similar comments about batteries and other tech, and make the same comment about inverters as well. So there's a lot of, um, you know, with the, the, the bottom line is we are going to have to roll out so much more solar and wind than we've done before. We're going to have to accelerate the production of it. We simply cannot afford to just have it all being made in one country. Frankly, it, we've, it, it is literally you know, all hands to the pumps to get this job of uh, energy, energy transition job done. And it's uh, ultimately, you've got to do the work. And, um, you know, it, when it comes to uh, all of these physical things, it's, as I used to remind people when I was responsible for f fixing up our broadband network, Moore's law does not apply to digging holes. So, um, you know, it does require a lot of investment and a lot of work and a lot of physical work. Yeah, just to, just to riff off that a, a little bit, um, it would be remiss uh, upon me, given that there is a Biden center, I think, here at, at Penn, to, to point out that, um, you know, the, the point that you made about the importance, for example, of the United States in, in taking more leadership in the manufacturing of, of solar energy um, and, 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 and wind turbines, that 
is what's most important about the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so, you know, it's not going to solve the climate crisis. It's not even going to get us to our commitments. Uh, it gets us on a path towards our commitments. But it does start to change the incentive structure. It does start to provide subs. You know, we've got for too long we've had our finger, our thumb on the wrong side of the scale. We've been providing subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. Why should we be subsidizing energy production that's hurting the planet? Um, so, a part of what it does is to level that playing field and to provide a lot more funding for the United States to do the fundamental research and to do the manufacturing, for example, of solar panels to see if we can start now to, to make a more appropriate contribution. You both started to answer what I think is the question for everyone right now, which is where do we need to get to, how quickly, and how are we going to get there? And are we falling short right now, even as we're praising ourselves for making some progress? So you began to answer that for us, Mr. Yeah. Former, former well, is, the, the answer is as soon as possible. I mean, zero, you know, net zero by 2050 is a sort of as a common goal, but we, we've really got to try to achieve that uh, as soon as we possibly can. I mean, time is not our friend. You know, the, the, uh, regrettably, the, you, know, you can have as many debates in Parliament and Congress and the media as you like, you're not going to change the inexorability of the physics. You know, if we keep increasing the volume of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the global warming phenomenon, phenomenon uh, will uh, proceed. And as Michael said, uh, it does not proceed in a linear fashion. You know, I, I mean, I'm old enough to remember Lotus 1, 2, 3. I call this uh, call. <laughs> I call this sort of approach, this linear approach, the backslash copy school of modeling, you know, where you, where you say, we think, you know, over time, you know, inflation will be X percent, and then you just paste it in for like 40, row, 40 columns as your assumption. Well, the world isn't like that. It might be on average, you might be right on average, but it's not going to, sure isn't, sure isn't going to be that number every single year. And the problem is it's the extremes that are going to be uh, you know, hurting us the, the most. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, we, we have to accelerate the transition. And the, the interesting thing in Australia, I'd say, so, so okay, I'll, I'll make a couple of points about Australia. Obviously, smaller, you know, big country, but smaller than the United States, about 25 million people. Interestingly, we have one of the world's largest, I think it probably is the world's largest connected energy grid. We have something called the NEM, the National Electricity Market, which covers all of Australia from the top of Cape York all the way down to Tasmania. Uh, in fact, all of Australia except the Northern Territory and Western Australia, right, which have their own markets. Uh, but so it's massive in terms of, you know, kilometres of transmission lines and so forth. Um, the coal-fired plants are being phased out and, and being phased out quite rapidly, partly because they're breaking down. And also partly because in hotter summers, they don't work. You know, when people say, oh, you need the reliability of coal-fired <laughs> power, you yeah, know, well, that's great. You get a really hot summer and it blows up. It's not very reliable. So, so the pace of transition is happening quickly. Uh, the, the challenge, however, is putting in place the storage uh, because we do not have any nuclear and we're not like the Canadians or even the US, we don't have big run of river hydro. Australia's quite a flat country. That's why we don't, that's why precipitation isn't as, as you know, that's why so much of the country is so dry. So the only, so once you take coal out of it, the only continue, the only, we will have no continuous generation at all of electricity. So we'll, it'll all be variable, I, I wind and solar. And then the question is, how do you store it? Hence, that's why I got the big Snowy Hydro 2 project underway, which is a gigantic pumped hydro scheme. I'm in the process of developing a couple of other pumped hydro projects, and there's a lot going on. That is one, there's, there's quite a bit of pumped hydro in America. It's very simple. You know, imagine a pond at the bottom of the hill and a pond at the top, and when electricity is cheap, you pump the water up to the top, and when it's in demand, you open the gate valve and it runs downhill through a turbine and generates electricity. It's, it's an oldie but a goodie, but, but we're going to need a huge amount more of it. 
and of course batteries and of course green hydrogen. But the, 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 the race that we're going to have is that as you take out continuous thermal generation or it takes itself out by failing, that you end up with an unreliable power grid. Uh, of course, you can always substitute that with gas, which you do in America, uh, which it, where gas here is relatively cheap, relatively to, to other parts of the world. But elsewhere in the world, gas has gone from, you know, $4 a gigajoule to 40 you know, just, just saying, that's a lot. And uh, that's, you know, in large part due to Vladimir Putin, of course. Uh, just a short follow-up comment um, to sort of give the most direct answer that I can to, to your question, Kathleen. What we need to do, um, as Malcolm said, we need to lower carbon emissions to, to zero. We have to bring them down to net zero by 2050. And net zero because uh, if there's some uptake of carbon, some carbon burial, that can offset some small amount of carbon emissions. So the, but basically has to be brought down to zero by 2050. But that's kicking the can very far down the road. And governments love to make commitments to targets in 2050 because they're not going to be held accountable for whether or not those targets are met. And that's why it's so important to talk about the near-term target. 2030, we've got to bring carbon emissions down by 50% by 2030. And the Inflation Reduction Act um, probably gets us to about 40%. So it doesn't go far enough. There's also a question about what baseline you use. And so is that 40% really 40% or is it more like 30 something percent? The point is it buys us quite a bit, but it doesn't get us to those targets. Now, let me remind you, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed in a 50-50 Senate with the approval of a coal state Democrat um, who has opposed meaningful climate policy for uh, a number of years. And we didn't think we were going to get anything because of that. But it, it turns out we did get, um, you know, that, 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 um, that, that important progress here. So if you don't like the fact that American climate policy, uh, that the gatekeeper of American climate policy right now is a single coal state Democrat, then you have to make sure that that person isn't the gatekeeper on climate policy. We can go further. We can get more aggressive climate legislation passed, but that will require a larger majority in the Senate of senators who support meaningful climate action. And that's why in how many days until these midterm elections, we all have an opportunity to help do that. If we really want to see the action that's necessary, we have to turn out in droves in the upcoming midterm elections and make sure that climate is on the ballot, that we vote on climate, and we get the majorities that are necessary for even more aggressive climate action. In your book on climate wars, you talk about the factors that are essentially standing in the way of getting this done. Can you, can you say, everybody vote, okay, that's a message. What can we do about getting those factors that are standing in the way and have successfully stood in the way in the past out of the way? And are, do we have lessons to learn from what Australia has done? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Malcolm and I have had conversations. We wrote this op-ed in The Guardian um, after Australia um, did pass, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, or when Australia voted in a, a new uh, coalition of labor and independence um, that supported climate action, and we've now seen that climate legislation pass, um, we wrote uh, this op-ed about the lessons that we can learn here in the United States from what happened in Australia. And there are a number of things that are different about the Australian system. Um, there is compulsory voting, so everybody has to vote. Um, you can be fined if you don't vote. It's hard to imagine that in the United States, but that's the way it is in Australia. That means we you get much higher voter uh, participation. There is no equivalent of gerrymandering, so that's not a factor. And in the op-ed we commented on, uh, you know, it might be very difficult, compulsory voting, you know, to actually uh, make that the law of the land would be an uphill battle here in, in the United States. There would be a lot of uh, opposition from one of the two parties in particular to that happening. Um, gerrymandering, we're probably, that's, that, that we're probably not going to get rid of that either. It's sort of um, endemic to uh, our political system. But ranked choice voting, 
is the third thing that really, and, it, and that's what made a difference, as Malcolm pointed out to me and we talked about in our piece. That's what really made the difference. Ranked choice voting allowed these uh, so-called teal independents, and it can be very confusing because teal is a cross between green and blue. Remember, things are flipped in Australia in the, in the southern hemisphere, so blue, uh, the colors of the Liberal Party, <laughs> um, who are, so who are the conservatives? Right party, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so these teal independents uh, uh, won in a number of uh, districts where they wouldn't have been able to to run. Uh, you know, they they couldn't win a straight majority. Well, of do you the want vote. me to quickly explain that? Yeah, please, please I do. I can probably get. Okay, so we have what we call preferential voting or ranked choice voting. And so you you have we have 151 seats in our House of Representatives. And there are now nine seats that had historically been absolutely roll gold safe, li larger liberal seats, so cent you know conservative or centre right seats, which are held by independents, small l liberal independents, who are all women, progressive on social issues, and very you know progressive from certainly from my point of view and. I suspect many people his point of view on climate action. How did that happen? Well, basically the maths is like this. The way ranked choice voting works is that unless one of the candidates gets on the first preference an absolute majority, i.e. 50% plus one, you then, you firstly eliminate the vote, the candidate who got the least number of first preference votes and distribute their second preferences. And so you go through the tally. So what typically happened, what has happened in these seats is that the liberal, the larger liberal incumbents vote, primary vote was brought down to about 40% or thereabouts. The independent small L liberal, you know, uh, you, you know, um, newcomer, got a primary vote of uh, say 30%. Now in a first past the post system, the person with 40% would beat the person with 30%. But what happened was the parties and candidates that came after that, the Labor Party, the Greens Party, the you know, other independents, the you know, monster rave, raving loony party or whatever, their preferences were distributed yeah and particularly the Labor and Green preferences, took that independent above the larger Liberal incumbent. Now, what that meant, together with, you know, in, you know, independently drawn districts and compulsory voting, it meant that when the larger Liberal Party, which is my party, which I, I'm obviously on the, you would say, on the left of that party, to say the least, um, that when the, when traditional larger liberal voters thought that, their, that the party they'd historically voted for was, was not doing the right thing on climate. They didn't have to vote for their traditional opponents, the Labor Party. They went, oh, hey, there's a nice candidate there. She looks like the sort of, she's saying the sort of things I wish the larger liberal party was saying. They might've even said, she's saying the sort of things Malcolm Turnbull used to say <laughs> when he was prime minister we might vote for her and bingo and so that's so that so yes there was a change from a liberal government to a labor government which of course is very important but this what's called the teal phenomenon that's only because that was the color of many of their t-shirts um is uh has been really profound and it uh it, it essentially it essentially has said uh to the larger liberal party you know what? You think your base, your base are people who listen to right wing populist media and have all sorts of, you know, uh, uh, views about global warming being a hoax and so forth. You think that's your base. You know what your base is? Your base is the people that generally vote for you. That's who your political base is. And there's a bunch of that base that decided they're not going to vote for you anymore. And you've now lost nine of your safest seats. So good luck getting a majority, buddy. It's gonna be really hard. Nine out of 151 is a lot. 
Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Malcolm, for uh, e explaining it, uh, you know, in a way that maybe even Sarah Palin uh, could understand. Uh, Those of you who are saying <laughs> it can't happen here, ask Sarah Palin. So uh, some of you may be aware Sarah Palin was... You think was... she can see Australia from there? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Um, but, but, you know, uh, as many of you uh, heard uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, she lost in that um, a special congressional election, a congressional seat that for the first time now um, is occupied by a Democrat. And that's because Alaska, which is not a, you know, we don't think of as a far left state. Uh, we don't think of Maine as a far left state. These are purple states, um, red to purple states, but both of them have ranked choice voting. And so what's important there is that ranked choice voting is something that you know has uh, if you do polling on this has huge bipartisan support conservatives as well as uh, progressives and where you know it, 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 it's not confined to liberal outposts um, the two states that have it are to um, moderate to conservative states and so it provides a blueprint for how we could start to create more space for you know the sorts of moderate conservatives, uh, the New England Republicans, um, you know who, who who interpreted conservatism in a, in in a way that I think is faithful to the term that believed that being conservative meant conserving the environment, um, creating more space for those sorts of candidates. Um, so it can happen, and I think that's one of the things that we need to push for is uh, a greater prevalence of ranked choice voting. And on that hopeful note, we're going to turn to a Zoom question. And those of you who have questions in the immediate audience, please get ready to tee them up. This question is not directed to any one of you, so either one of you can take it. Currently, there's a race to mine minerals from the seafloor, oftentimes minerals used for clean energy. But this could also start a new environmental crisis. How do you see this playing out in the Pacific, where mining, the case of Nauru, has been detrimental to the environment and people who live in that environment? And what can young people around the world do to respond to the climate crisis? Two questions, not one. So let's take the first about the race to mine minerals from the sea. Well, look, it, it, it clearly has, has got to be, if it's going to be done at all, it's got to be done in a manner that is not environmentally damaging or where the environmental impact is one that is, uh, you know, acceptable in terms of its impact on you know the biodiversity so it's a it is i mean i i wouldn't i don't think you could say there should be no mining no subsea mining full stop uh and and nor should would you any more than you'd say there should be no terrestrial mining full stop but in each case you've got to be able to uh really rigorously assess the environmental impact and of course that's that's not an easy thing to do yeah you know i it one of the, the things I always try to underscore in these conversations, um, this is a, you know, a something people, uh, you know, uh, people often ask me about this, you know, can we continue on this path of increased extraction, you know, a resource, a growing and a forever growing resource driven global economy and it's easy to answer that question. No, <laughs> we could not on a finite planet. Um, there, you know, a, a, an ever increasing extraction resource dependent global economy is fundamentally incompatible with a sustainable existence on this planet. And so there is a longer term battle that we have to fight um, to find a way to live sustainably on this planet. And that's going to mean less consumption. That's going to mean more conservation. Um, that's there are a whole lot of things that ultimately have to change. Um, but we don't have much time at all to act on the climate crisis. And so my argument has always been we need to work within the system that exists right now to accomplish the sorts of changes that we've been talking about, to move away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy. We've got to do that now because we can't wait to solve uh, the climate crisis or it becomes too late. That having been said, there is this longer term challenge um, that we do need to move away and what what that will look like, you know, what a global economy will look like. People talk about a circular economy. Um, that's a that's an important conversation that I hope we will continue to have here at Penn um, in, in the years ahead because it's a critical conversation. Kathleen, can I just add a footnote to that? Just uh, 
you know, a lot of people put a lot of faith in batteries. Batteries use a lot of, uh, you know, uh, rare rare metals. Um, the one of the advantages of pumped hydro is that it has nothing of that sort. I mean, it's essentially you're, you know, talking about steel and concrete. You know, which we're not going to run out of iron ore, and we're certainly not going to run out of concrete. Uh, the the other thing. Um, is with solar panels, you know, silver uh, is is a key component in the manufacture of solar panels. Uh, you know, one, uh, you know, some Australian researchers who who we've, in, you know, I, I'm a nowadays a venture capitalist among other things, but I used to do that before I was in politics. In fact, but but you know, work who are working on replacing the silver with copper because copper is a more common. Mineral. I mean, we, we, you know, we just we, we've got to really. Uh, again, we can't do the backslash copy extrapolation of the production of something which depends on a resource, the availability of which is not cannot be exponentially increased. Yeah, I mean, and gr green hydrogen is something I think we need to be talking yeah. about as well, uh, because again, it doesn't come with some of the same problems yeah. that uh, solar panel manufacturing and wind turbine manufacturing come with. Let's turn now to a question. I'm going to rephrase it just a little bit. The question asks, what can young people around the world do to respond to the climate crisis? Let me rephrase it just a little bit to say, is there a role for individual action in face of these problems, which are daunting and large and have st strong structural drivers? Well, I'll be, I, Michael and I, I think completely agree with this. The first thing young people can do is firstly, grow up and vote, get to voting age and then vote. <laughs> Second thing they can do is until they get to voting age, encourage everyone who is of voting age to vote to vote for people who are going to take action on climate. Inter individual action is important, you know, whether it is recycling or choices you make with vehicles and so forth, but, you know, it's, it isn't a substitute. And I do worry that there is a slight parallel when people em companies emphasize individual action with what the plastics industry did with recycling one of the greatest con jobs of all time okay plastic pollution is one of the biggest threats to biodiversity you all know that we were sold a story that you could recycle plastic and so it didn't matter how much plastic we 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 you know bought consumed because it could all be recycled like maybe 15 percent of it is recycled at best you know the solution to plastic pollution is to get single-use plastics out of the waste stream full stop and so individual action yes do your recycle australians are maniacal recyclers we've got so many garbage bins of different colors you know have to be a genius to work out what to put into which one and i and i and it, it and it's all good stuff, but there is no substitute, wait for it, for stopping burning fossil fuels. Right. If you stop burning fossil fuels, right, you've got three quarters of the emissions dealt with. And of course, you've got land use and many other things as well. But ultimately, political, uh, political leadership and political concerted action, which really can only come from governments, is what's going to make the difference. So gets back to voting. Yeah, you know, Malcolm and I very much sing the same tune on this, and uh, it's something that I talk about a fair amount in, in the new climate war. Uh, you know, plastics, what are they? They're petroleum. Where have we heard petro <laughs> petroleum? Oil? <laughs> um, so there are large, you know, powerful vested interests. Sometimes they're essentially essent the, the same vested interest that have a stake in us continuing with business as usual, and they're going to put forward narratives that deflect attention away from the fundamental challenge, which is, as Malcolm said, we need to stop, we need to end our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, we need to stop burning carbon. Now that's inconvenient for the largest, most powerful industry on the face of the planet, the fossil fuel industry. And they fought tooth and nail against efforts to do that, trying to put the onus on individuals, that it's not you know, why is it that, you know, the very first carbon footprint calculator came to us from, wait for it, British Petroleum, <laughs> uh, because they wanted us so focused on our own carbon footprint that we failed to take note of theirs, 75% of our carbon emissions, just 100 uh, 
companies uh, or corporations are responsible um, for, I, I believe it is 75% uh, of carbon emissions. So the bottom line is, yes, let's do all of everything that we can to minimize our environmental impact and our, and our individual carbon footprint. Uh, you know, these are no regrets actions. They save us money, they make us healthier, they make us feel better about ourselves, they set a great example for other people. What we can't do is allow polluters to convince us that that is the solution to the problem because we can't impose a price on carbon. We can't provide subsidies for the renewable energy industry. We can't block, we try to block pipelines, but we can't stop new fossil fuel infrastructure. Only our policymakers can do that and we need to hold them accountable. And one of the things that kids can do, yeah, they can vote, they can wait until they can vote, um, but they can put pressure on you know the adults in their life. That's what uh, the tantrum that saved the world is really about, this young girl, Sophia, mm -hmm. who basically becomes the change that she wishes to see in the world. And one of the things that I loved in the, in the wake of the, it was the Parkland uh, shooting. Um, and now we've seen this repeated um, in other areas. Kids demanding that their children sign a contract to them that they will not vote for you know, a politician who opposes common sense gun reforms. Similarly, they should not vote. Children should make their parents sign a contract that they will not vote for politicians who are obstacles to meaningful action on climate. And speaking of which, I want to put in a plug for the Searcy Faculty Pledge. The Faculty Senate Searcy Committee has a pledge out to the faculty. We want every faculty member to commit not only to individual change, to change in their lives and households, but to departmental change and to university change and to national change and to international change. So if you're a faculty member and haven't signed that pledge, please go to the Faculty Senate website and do that. And students, let's see if we can't make pen plastic free. Why can't we? Thank you to the folks at Perry World House who are modeling a world in which you don't have to drink from plastic bottles when you're sitting on a dais. Michael Weisberg, you have a question. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, this is a question really uh, for both of you, but inspired by a comment you've made a few times about the Murdoch uh, media empire. Mike has written about it. I think maybe Prime Minister Turnbull has as well. I just very directly want to ask you, what's the way to respond to it? So of the various forces of darkness, uh, they are one of the greatest ones in this area. And both of you are so, um, speak with such kind of uh, clarity and simplicity, I would love to hear your media advice for all of us. Thank you. Well, look, it, look, we, in both our societies, we value free speech, right? So we're not, we're not into censorship, but I think it's really important to hold media to account. Um, the, you know, climate denial is obviously what we're talking about today, but, you know, uh, the attempted coup on the 6th of January 2021 didn't just shake the United States, it shook the world. I mean, our freedom, our democracy, our security in Australia was as much threatened by that as yours was, okay? Uh, that that was that whole exercise was based on a massive lie, i.e. that Donald Trump won the election and Joe Biden stole it, uh, which was amplified in right wing media and by no source more loudly or influentially than by Fox News. So, you know, I, I look, listen, it's I mean, I, I should never give other people advice how to run their countries because you know you you know i don't some people think i didn't do a perfect job running my own so the uh, uh <laughs> but the bottom line is i don't think there is any in individual alive that has done more damage to american democracy than murdoch and he is after all an australian export although i might say he renounced his australian citizenship so he is entirely yours nowadays <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to, I mean, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Malcolm said. And, you know, there is some accountability here. If, you're, if, you've, been, if you've been following the news, um, you know, when you lie and, and libel people or organizations in the process of lying, uh, for example, about the January 6th or voting machines uh, in particular, um, you can be held accountable. Um, by our court system. And right now there are a number of lawsuits that are working their way through the courts that 
do have the potential to hold Rupert Murdoch and News Corp accountable for their villainy. This would be the Dominion suits. Everybody should be watching the word Dominion. Hello. Sorry. Yeah. Hello. I'm a sophomore at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, Tell us your name. My name is Richard. So a lot of the talk tonight is about prevention. For instance, net zero and CO2 emissions. I want to ask about adaptation and resiliency, particularly because currently um, Russia, Ukraine supply shocks, as well as Indian heat waves this year are driving food inflation and the necessities to live are being threatened internationally. My question is as follows. How does the Australian government plan to, either in this bill or in future legislation, address systemic cascading climate risks, including but not limited to refugees, food shocks, droughts, water shortages, multi bread gap basket failure, and other conflict-driven supply shortages, and secure resiliency for food, water, and energy supply chains? OK, well, the, the area in which, uh, well, obviously, looking after all of those issues, you know, for our own people and our own country, uh, the area in which we provided the most climate uh, resilience and adaptation assistance is in the Pacific, you know, where there are obviously a number of uh, island states that are, you know, face an absolutely existential threat. You know, it's not, not a question of things going to get worse. It's, the, you know, their country will be underwater. Uh, the, uh, I mean, some of you, um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but uh, a lot of the Pacific Island islands that are coral atolls uh, basically have a, what is called a freshwater lens. So there is fresh there is fresh water. You know, it's come from rainfall that is sitting as literally as a lens on top of seawater. And as sea levels rise, that freshwater lens gets you know, polluted, if you like, or infiltrated by the salt water. And so it's not just a question of the waves washing, you know, the island away or everyone suddenly deciding, discovering the waters up to their waist or anything like that. It's literally these, these islands are being, well, some of them, I, I fear it's too late, will become uninhabitable. So yes, we are definitely uh, uh, providing support there. And I think ultimately, there, is go there are going to be whole communities that are going to have to relocate, and I would expect uh, they will relocate in some part to Australia and New Zealand, other parts to other parts of the Pacific. But it is a, um, it's, it's really existential. I mean, a lot of countries have this problem on their coastlines. You know, a lot of cities, are, well, New Orleans is a good example here, you know, Shanghai in China, Jakarta in Indonesia, there's a whole list of them. Cities that are built on deltas, Venice, another one, long list, uh, typically have this problem that uh, the, not only are they facing rising sea levels, but the alluvium on which they are built is compressing, and that compression is exacerbated by pumping groundwater out. You know, water has a volume. You know, a thousand litres is a cubic metre, so it's, water is actually both heavy and bulky. You pump a thousand litres out, you're taking a cubic metre of volume out of wherever you're pumping it from. And so that's why, you know, a city like Jakarta, for example, you know, about 50% of that city is now below sea level. Uh, so anyway, all of those issues are around the world. But of course, those places, at least they have got a hinterland to which they can retreat. If that's if all you've got is at that sort of threat level, You've got nowhere else to go. So yeah, that's where that's where most of our climate, directly climate related aid and support is going. Just very brief uh, follow up to that. Um, so our, our former presidential science advisor, a friend of mine, uh, John Holdren of MIT, I, I think um, once sort of framed the problem. I think with the greatest clarity when it comes to the climate crisis. You know, uh, the choices that we have amount to three possible actions mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. We would like to minimize the suffering, and so that is going to require some combination of mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation, we have to prevent all of the climate change that we can still prevent. 
while adapting to those changes that are now locked in, that are now baked in. And one of the greatest injustices of climate change is that those who had the least role in creating the problem are the ones who are being hit hardest by it. It's true within the United States because of poverty and economic injustice, but it's true internationally as well. Uh, the global south, tropical countries um, who are seeing some of the worst consequences of climate change, um, uh, but lack the infrastructure and wealth to deal with it. And that's why it's so critical that you know, that we, the, the, you know, industrial countries of the world, not just lower our carbon emissions, but provide the resources to the developing world, to uh, developing nations for two reasons. One, to help them cope, to help provide them with the infrastructure that they need to deal with the consequences they're already experiencing. But we also have to make sure that it is economically advantageous for them to leapfrog past the fossil fuel stage as they develop their economies. One of the first things that happened in the Trump administration was to get rid of the provisions um, uh, under the, the previous conference of the parties that committed the United States um, to provide assistance and aid to developing countries. And that is one of the areas where we're now starting to see some leadership, but not enough leadership. And that's part of what I'll just make one more point. A lot of people have vilified India because uh, at COP26, very late in the game, they sort of came in and they watered down the language. They said, no, we don't want language that says we have to uh, phase out fossil fuels. We want language that says we will phase them down. A lot of people criticize India for that, but it was their way in essence, in my interpretation, of them expressing their displeasure with the fact that the industrial countries hadn't provided the resources that they had promised to provide uh, developing nations for the reasons that we talked about. With apologies to those who have unanswered questions, we've reached our time. I'd like to give each of our guests a chance to tell you the one most important thing that they want to leave you with. So one idea they want you to take to bed tonight and wake up with tomorrow. Uh, vote. <laughs> Urgency and agency. We need dramatic action. It's not too late. Thanks to Perry Worldhouse and our guests.